Well, um, starting a new series today, and it's going to go on for six weeks, and it's about uh, the two major themes of the Bible, uh, covenant and kingdom. And, you know, we, this is a, an overview of biblical truth, and we kind of tend to focus on the small things. And, and I, I admit, I like the small things in the Bible. I love to just look at one verse and get into the, the language and the words, and, and that's, that's, that's really good. But sometimes we neglect the big picture. And uh, there was this, um, during Christmas, there's always this, these Lexus commercials. And, you know, it gives guys, stimulates you with ideas if you can't think of the right thing to get your wife, a Lexus. You know, well, what could be better than a Lexus? And there was one that uh, I, I thought was just really interesting because she comes downstairs and there's this new SUV in the living room, right, with this big red bow on top. And she says, where did you get that big of a red bow? <laughs> it's like the question isn't, how did you get the Lexus into the living room, but where did you get that big red bow? And, I, and sometimes we're kind of like that with the Bible, you know, as we just look at the little things and we miss the, the, the big things. So for six weeks, we're going to look at just two themes and get the big picture of what God is doing. And uh, the Bible is a story about uh, covenant and kingdom. Covenant is about relationships, about uh, two becoming one, and kingdom is about responsibility, what it is that God wants you to do on his behalf, relationship and responsibility. And relationship is about being you know, you can't have a relationship with somebody without being with them, about hanging with them, about spending the time, right? And so we have words like abide that, that you know, relate that in, in Scripture. And responsibility is about doing. And sometimes we, you know, we know how to abide and not do. Sometimes we want to do without abiding. And, but both of those are together. So this is a story of the Bible and, you know, somebody right now that's kind of scholarly might be thinking, okay, Don, this is like, you know, Bible kindergarten. Uh, we're a little further along than Bible kindergarten. And why are you taking this, you know, back so far? You can't reduce the Bible down to just two themes. Well, you might be looking at the bows. You know, it just might be possible that you're just looking at the bows in, in the Bible and that you're not seeing the Lexus that's there, you know, of how God does this fantastic thing. Oh, and I forgot to disclose, uh, this is not all my stuff, so don't think I'm this smart. I don't think I'd fool very many of you anyway, but uh, this comes from a book uh, by Mike Breen, and I just, I just love this book, and it's, you know, it's got some great teaching in it, so wanted to share this with us. So today we begin with covenant, um, of God joining himself to us, of becoming one with us. Next week, we're going to look at kingdom, look at Joseph, and a rather confident, stylish young man who demonstrated his kingdom responsibility. But today, we're going to look at four passages of covenant, and we're not going to read them all. Uh, it's all in Genesis. It's the story of Abram and Sarai, or Abraham and Sarah as they become. So here's Genesis 12, 1 to 3, is where we're going to start. The Lord said to Abram, again, that's Abraham before his name's changed, leave your land, your family, your father's household, and the land that I will show you, and I will make you a great nation and will bless you, and I will make your name respected, and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, those who curse you, I will curse. All the families of the earth will be blessed because of you. Now, God had been reaching out to Abram, and the passage marks a new era, a new thing that God's doing here, the first part of Genesis 12. And there's this huge promise. I mean, God, he says, is going to make him a great nation. All the families of the earth are going to be blessed through you or because of you. And it's like, you know, this is just, it doesn't get any bigger than this as a promise to a man. You are a woman. You know, everybody, you're going to do something fantastic, and everybody is going to be blessed through you. And at this time, Abram's 75 years old. I'm starting to identify with that. Not quite yet, but I'm starting to identify with what it would mean to be in your 70s. And he has no children. 
Okay, all he has is Lot, his nephew, and Lot's like 40 years old, but he acts like he's about 14, okay? And so he, he really has not, Abraham has not, you know, been blessed a whole lot. To be 75 and childish, childish in those days was, was really a bad thing because to them what it meant, your life had been not very good because you're going to die and your line's just going to end right there. And to them, family was everything. The family line was everything. But God makes this huge promise to Abram on one condition. And the condition is, is that you are going to leave your father's land and you're going to move to a place that I'm going to show you, God says. And as we read on, we see where that land is. He calls him into this place called Canaan. And that's, you know... Later, it's known as the Promised Land. It's now known pretty much as Israel today. But there's just one problem with Canaan. You know, really nice place, except they're Canaanites in Canaan. That's the only rub, you know. So just a little foreshadowing of what's going to develop later. But it, it kind of compares to God saying, saying to us, you know, I'm going to form an entire nation from you, um, you, th you thought your life was about done, but now I'm going to make an entire nation out of you. As a matter of fact, everybody in the world is going to know who you are. You go, well, I'm 75, you know, even at 35, it'd be hard to hear, but I'm 75 years old, and this is just, it's just huge. And God says, okay, are you ready? And you go, well, I guess. Um, he says, all right, well, I'll tell you what I want you to do is I want you to leave Lexington, and I want you to move to, you know, where I'm going to do this is in Iran. So you, you don't mind moving to Iran, do you? Um, and he said, ooh, I don't know. Iran? You know? Saudi Arabia, maybe. Iran? They hate Americans in Iran. Abraham does it. Packs up his minivan. You know, there's Sarah there and, and uh, Lot's in the, in the back seat with his buds in and, you know, they, they got tents up on top, and all the goats and the sheep are following them, and off they go into Canaan. And he gets into Canaan, and he gets to Bethel, and what does he do? But he sets up an altar, and there he worships the Lord that brought him there. That's the first thing that he does when he gets there. Now, as we begin our investigation into covenant, I think it's crucial just to realize two things here. And the first one is that, that God initiates the covenant. God starts the relationship. God's grace comes before our knowledge of God. God reaches out to us. And that's each one of our stories, whether you know it or not, is that God reached out to you. If you have faith, somehow God reached out to you with his grace. You didn't discover him, you see, but he revealed himself to you. That's where it starts. The second thing is, is that Abram was listening. I, I believe that God's always speaking. It's just seldom are we listening. And, you know, you hear this God spoke to Abraham. You go, well, how did that happen? I mean, we can't imagine that kind of vivid uh, understanding of what God wants us to do. But it's, it's my self-awareness that I'm not as good of a listener as I should be, not ought, but could be if I want to really get God's promises. And I think God is always speaking to us. It's just that we're not listening. So those two things. Now the second passage is, is Genesis 15. I'm not going to read all that, um, but it begins with the Lord coming to Abraham, and some time has passed, and and now Lot, you know, has gone off in his own direction. He's got his own land down there in what we'll call the trend, Twin Cities, Sodom and Gomorrah. You probably know, have heard about these two Twin Cities before. Sodom and Gomorrah, you know how that all turns out. And God appears to Abram, and he says, Abram, in this vision, he says, don't be afraid. He says, I'm a shield to you. Now, the, the word in Hebrew for shield is the same word as sovereign, Okay. And Abraham understands this. He knows what God is saying, and he replies. He says, O sovereign Lord. He understands what God is telling him is that I am your sovereign, and like a king over the subjects, the king is going to protect and take care of everybody that lives in his land. He's saying, I am the sovereign, and I'm a shield over you. I'm a protector over you. You're in my land now. You're in Canaan, and I am going to protect you. So we're starting to feel this relationship here. 
And Abraham says, Sovereign Lord, I have been waiting now for years to receive what you promised. Because remember, God says, I'm going to make you a great nation. You're going to have all these kids. I've been waiting for years, and all I've got is Eleazar, who's my servant. And, you know, here's his servant, and the servant's going to inherit all this stuff. And Abraham's a wealthy man. Abraham's got a lot of uh, uh, stock, and, and he's, he's, God has prospered him. So God gives him a little help with his faith. And you see, the promises of, of God, uh, this is another thing. I, I think his, his promises are so huge, so great, that it just, it's like, you know, ridiculous promises. They just sound so big sometimes. And so it's unbelievable. Uh, and so God takes him outside of the tent, and he, he says, look up. He says, you see all those stars? Now, I don't know if you've ever been out away from the city to look at the stars on a summer night, but there's a lot more stars out there than what there are in Lexington, right? Uh, you just can't see them because of our lights. But here's Abraham out, you know, a nomad. And he looks up and he sees all those stars. He says, I promise you, Abram, that you will have more children than these stars. Now, later, I think it's, it's a descendant of Abraham, David, who in... Uh, Psalm 8 uh, said, O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth, uh, who have displayed your splendor among the heavens. When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon, the stars, which you have ordained, what is man that you take thought of him and the son of man that you care for him? So it's like, wow, you know, God owns all these stars, and he's telling me that I'm going to have as many children as what I see in this guy. Abraham receives it. He says, okay, I'll take that. I mean, this just blows my mind that Abraham would, would get that promise. It's so huge. But it says in, in Genesis 15, 6, it says, the, the next verse right after this, he says, Then he believed in the Lord, and he reckoned to him as righteousness. I, I, I put the translation down that's in the Bibles, the pew Bibles that we have here or the chair Bibles, floor Bibles, um, Genesis 15, 6, and it says, Abraham trusted the Lord, and the Lord recognized Abraham's high moral character. So God sees his heart. He sees what he's made of on the inside. Now, what, what happens is, is just really important next, because I think it's difficult for us to understand. For up to this point, it's been promises from God to Abram, but it's about to go to a new level, and God's about to ratify this promises with Abraham with a covenant. And this is difficult for us to, to grasp. I mean, it really is. You may not be able to take it in today. I, I don't know. Because we're not much of a covenant-making society anymore. We, we don't make covenants with each other. We make contracts. We negotiate things, but we don't make covenants. This is different. The closest thing that we have to a covenant today is a marriage. And in a marriage... Essentially, and we still call that a covenant, but in a marriage, essentially what it means is I no longer have anything that's not yours. You don't no longer have anything that's not mine. As a matter of fact, the two become one. That's the imagery, right? The two of us are now one person. So when you're happy, I'm happy. When you're sad, I'm sad. That's the way it works in a covenant, in a marriage covenant. And that's about the only thing that we still have in our culture where covenants are made. But they give up individual identities, and, you know, that's the covenant uh, ceremony. And symbolically, um, not so much in the covenant uh, ceremony, although it might be helpful, uh, somebody has to die, you know, symbolically for a covenant to happen. Somebody has to die. Wouldn't it be interesting if in our marriage covenant if we had, you know, some kind of a figure of the old person that we were and say, well, now, you know, this is old Don, and now that he's married, he, old single Don, Don's got to die, and, and, you know, we could, I don't know, hang him and burn him or something. That, that might be useful uh, to, to start a, a marriage out, to have the symbolic death of the old single person. And, you know, it says in, in Hebrews uh, 9, uh, 16, 17, I just thought of this just recently, it says, in a covenant we know that there must be death, is what the writer says. And that's, he, he means symbolic death. And that's how it was done. I mean, animal rights would have 
animal rights people would have a fit with what's, what's going on. But this is ancient stuff. Uh, and God says, he says, bring me a three-year-old heifer to Abram and a three-year-old f- uh, female goat, a three-year-old ram, a turtle dove, and a young pigeon. And Abraham thinks, yes, God's going to cut a covenant with me. Because this is how they did things. He says, I've been waiting for this. And he goes and he brings them back and he does a little field dressing, you know. Um, he uh, cuts them as God instructs him. He says, you know, you're to separate them into half. Huh. And so Abraham's out there, you know, with his, with his knives, sharpening up his knives, uh, takes these animals, cuts them in half, field dresses them. And then as God instructs him, he puts them in two rows, two parallel rows. You know, the heifer and the goats and the rams and the, and the birds. And, you know, and he waits. And he waits. God told him to do this. And, you know, there's Abraham, and it's taken him all day to, to do this work. And he's got blood all over him, right? He'd, he'd have blood up to his elbows, field dressing these, these animals. And the sun goes down, and he's out in the field, and he's, he's bloody, and he's tired, and He's probably by this time just a little bit confused because God has told him to do this, but what's going to happen here? And he falls asleep, and when he falls asleep, the Lord appears. And the Lord appears, it says, in the presence of a smoking fire pot. Now, a smoking fire pot was like their Bic lighter of the day. It's this little clay pot that they would put the coals from the last fire in and restrict the air so those coals would stay alive. For days, as if you didn't let air into him. Once you let air into him, then the fire would start. So he has his smoking fire pot is what he sees, and then a flaming torch. And these two things represent the presence of God. And they move back and forth. They go through this corridor of blood of these animals that have been cut open. And God, you know, is represented in that. And in the darkness... Um, Abram sees the fire pot and the flaming torch, and and there he is. He's out, you know, under these stars that are a promise of the future, and he has uh, sacrificed these things, and and these animals represent his death. These animals represent Abram's death. That I no longer am Abram, but and the Lord is now making a covenant with me, and we are no longer two, but we are one. And, you know, in their day, the people, they got this. Um, Making a covenant means to cut a covenant. There's always got to be the death of an animal. And God calls Abraham, and he initiates this covenant with him. And in essence, he's saying, we are now one. We are one identity, Abraham and Yahweh. We are one. And what was, was God's was now Abraham's, and consequently, what was Abraham's is now God's. They, they share things together. And the, the two symbols here are death and birth. Uh, death is represented in the death of the animals. And, you know, I've given up my identity. I've walked through this corridor of blood. I've gone to the other side where my covenant brother is waiting for me to identify with him. And, and everything that I have is, is his now. And, and then God passes through the pieces. And he, he chooses and this is, this is a turn for us. God chooses to give up his freedom. He enters into this covenant restriction with Abraham. And he's now restricted by the covenant that he shares with Abraham. And in years to come, there would be times when Abraham's descendants would do some really stupid things. And God would say, well, but Abraham, that's what he said, you know, in other words, you deserve judgment but you're a descendant of Abraham, and I made a covenant with Abraham, see? And so God actually restricts himself here. Now, if we're hearing this for the first time, it's, I know it's, it's quite a bit to take in that God would join himself with the human, that God would limit himself by passing through the symbolic birth canal here, okay, and dying. And the covenant account uh, is... There's enough power and, and meaning of its, of its own, but, but when we see it from this side of the cross, this side of the incarnation, the birth of Jesus, you know, he enters God's world uh, through blood, through birth, 
and God dying, God dying so that others might have life. You know, uh, Jesus actually becomes that covenant sacrifice in the same way that those animals were. And that, you know, that's just grace. That God would stoop down to us. That God would stoop to us and, and sacrifice himself. It's absolutely amazing. So God is saying that he is one with us. We need to be clear as to what that means. And that means that everything that God has is now yours. And everything that God has access to, you know how have access to. You have complete freedom to converse with him. You no longer need to hide from God. You can seek him out face to face and talk to him. Our third section is chapters 17 and 18. And Genesis 17 starts it off, verses 1 to 2. When Abraham was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abraham and said to him, I am El Shaddai, walk with me and be trustworthy. I will make a covenant between us and I will give you many, many descendants. Now, that, that phrase, walk with me and be trustworthy, stands out after all these years. Abraham still hasn't received the promises. He still doesn't have any children, okay? And Sarai, his wife, who would have bore the shame of this because they didn't get their freshman sex ed class. They didn't get biology. They, they thought it was all the woman's fault when, the, when there was no child that was born. But God comes to them and he says, walk with me and be trustworthy. And I, I don't want us to miss this aspect of it in this relationship. God calls for their behavior after he has given them identity. See, in the covenant, he gives them his identity. And it's never the other way around. God doesn't say, if you would walk with me, be trustworthy, then I will give you my identity. But he gives them identity not based on anything that they've done, but what he has done. So it's relationship, and then we get the fruit. He says, live in connection with me, and that relationship is going to be expressed in a change in your behavior. You're not going to behave differently in order to get me to love you, but I love you, and that's going to change the way that you behave. It's like a child imitating a parent. That's why I showed you that video to begin with, you know, of the, of the little boy imitating the son. It would, or the little boy imitating the father. Uh, we see that so much with, with children. It's a, it's a really neat thing to see that when, when, and they don't imitate just parents, but they imitate other adults. I remember when uh, I was just a little boy, and the snow made me think about it, was I would follow my dad around. I was probably eight or nine years old, and I'd follow him around, and he was a farmer and as, as in Illinois, and the snow was about that deep up there, some, about all, all winter long. Um, it seemed that way. But even when it was knee deep, I would follow my dad out to do his chores and have to walk in, try to walk in his, his footsteps because he would cut a footstep through the snow, right, this deep. And if I could put my foot in his footstep, I'd be okay. But if I went down another place, it would come all the way up my knees, see? So trying to imitate my father, trying to walk in the steps of my father. And we, we all do that. And here, you know, God says to him, he says, walk with me. Walk the way that I walk. Imitate me and be trustworthy. Good things. And then uh, God changes uh, their names. Abraham meant exalted father, uh, no doubt because his father was of royalty. Um, and God changes his name from Abram to Abraham and uh, uh, father of a multitude of nations, um, enlarged it a lot. Sarai's name changes just slightly, but it becomes Sarah, which means princess. And I was thinking about that this week. Can you imagine, you know, here's Abraham, age 99. He's sitting around the fire one night, and he goes, you know, guys, instead of calling me exalted father, I think it'd be good if you called me father of many nations. And, you know, he's 99. And uh, Sarah here, uh, she's no longer Sarai. Uh, she's 90. Let's call her princess. What, what, what do you think? <laughs> it would have been kind of, you know, a difficult conversation, right? But that's the kind of conversation he would be had as, as God gives him a name that matches his destiny and what, what he's going to be. And then God says, oh, yeah, and as a sign of the covenant, 
I want to give you a scar. And, you know, Abraham says, uh, that'll work, a scar. Yeah, maybe something here on my hand, you know, some kind of a scar so people will see that, that you and I are in covenant together. Maybe, maybe a scar here on my heart, you know, so others will see that, that Yahweh and I are in covenant together. And, and God just says, eh, I think circumcision is where we'll go. And, <laughs> Abraham, you know, is this a multiple choice or are there any other options is got to be the first thing that he asks. You know, people all the time are saying that the Bible is written by men. This absolutely proves that the Bible is not written by men. Amen? Could not be. Impossible. All right, we'll move on. But all of this is about covenant, about becoming one with God. And another aspect of this covenant relationship we see as we have access to our covenant partner is the bond is so strong that even mortal men engage with God. Chapter 18, um, right after this incident, it goes on and, and says that three men arrive in camp. Two of them are angels. One of them is God. One of them is uh, Jesus pre-incarnate. And we see how Abraham... Uh, and other people down through the centuries enters into this, you know, engaging dialogue with God. It's almost an auction. You remember this story? They go, well, we're headed down to the Twin Cities, you know, where Lot lives, and there's been this stink that's been coming up from down there, and we just can't overlook it anymore, you know. And Abraham enters into this dialogue with God, and you go, Wow. You know, he says, well, if there are 50 men there, will you destroy them? And, uh, you know, God says, no, won't we'll destroy them if there are 50 men. He goes, well, hey, how about 45? Will you give me 45? Maybe 40. Hey, how about 40? You know, and he comes all the way down to five men. And God says, no, I won't destroy them, even if there's just five men there. I will not destroy them. And, you know, maybe the first time you read that, you think, who do you think you are? Abraham. You're, you're kind of arguing with God. You're kind of, you know, are you trying to tell God what to do? There's just 50 righteous men there and get him down to five. And, and I, I, I'm sure Abraham would have said, hey, we're in covenant together. That's, that's God. You see, we've, we, we've both died. What his is mine. Mine is his. We, we talk face to face. I don't have to hide from Yahweh anymore. Because where he goes, I go. Where, where I go, he goes. So, so I don't talk to him like an outsider. We've got blood between us. I'm sure that's what Abraham would have said. We've got blood between us. So, so why don't we talk to God that way? You know, most, most of us, not most of us, I need to say this correctly. We often, Christians often talk to God, we're begging him. What can I do? Please, please, please. You know, and God says, we're in covenant together. What's yours is, is mine. What's mine is yours. We've shared blood. My own son has been blood between us. So why don't you come into my presence and just say, you know, you read some of the Psalms and you get this. You know, it's like there's, there's these Psalms that you read and, and the, the psalmist says, I, I don't understand this, Lord, because my enemies are triumphing over me. And you said you were my protector, you were my shield, so what's going on? You know, and they've got this, this boldness before the Lord. And it's, it's, they're not being arrogant, they're, they're, they're not being disrespectful. They're standing in their covenant promises. They're standing in their covenant relationship. And it's perfectly, I, I think it's, it's great to engage God and even give God the honor of asking Him, could you please explain this to me because I don't understand what's going on. I don't understand what's going on in my life right now. And if, if you would just reveal it to me, you know, I, I'm, I'm not challenging your right to do this, Lord. But, if I, you know, what's yours is mine. I want to know more. You're one with his. The last thing is that we find out is that what is ours is his too. And this is the most difficult part of the Abraham story. Um, last episode in Genesis we're going to touch on here, uh, Genesis 22, 
beginning with the first verse. After these events, God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham, and Abraham answered, I'm here. Okay, again, he's listening, right? And God said, Take your son, your only son, whom you love, Isaac, and go to the land of Moriah. Offer him up as an entirely burnt offering there in one of the mountains that I will show you. See, this covenant thing goes both ways. Not only is what God has ours, but what is ours is his. What's mine is his. And what's, you know, I can't remain in covenant with him if I just want to withhold someone or something from him. There's nothing private here. There's nothing off bounds. Really kind of a silly conversation, you know, because it's all his anyway. But we, we think that we have ownership of so much in life. And this is the test of Abraham. It's shown that when Abraham is called upon to give up the greatest thing in his life, his only son, the son that he waited for a hundred years. And, you know, God says, look at your son. This is what I promised. Have I not been faithful to you? Through this one son, all the people of the earth are going to be blessed. And since he's everything to you, Abraham... I've got to have him. I've got to have him. And you know how the story goes from the top of the mountain. That boy's tied up there, and he's on top of the altar with the wood underneath him. And there's his father with a knife raised over him. And we hear the bleat of a ram that's caught in the thicket that God has provided a sacrifice. And we have this just... It's an amazing picture of Jesus. Just this amazing picture of Jesus being the substitute, you know. And God wants all that we are, everything that we are. And, and Jesus says, I can make that provision. I, I, I can be everything. Jesus calls to us and he says, I want you to take up your cross and follow me with all that you are. You don't get to hold anything back. Everything is mine, because we're in covenant, you remember? And you can ask the Father, he said, for anything in my name, and he's going to give it to you. Anything. Ask him. That's covenant. Heavy stuff, isn't it? I don't know, it just blows your mind. Let that sink in for a while. Um, I know I've uh, probably gone deeper into this than, than what we're used to going, but... This is core. This is core of what it means to, to be a Christian, to be a Christ follower, is to understand what covenant is. Let's, let's just sit in prayer for a minute. As deep cries out